my name is Nikki Reg, and I'm the Outreach Services Librarian. Our scholar in residence here at Savannah State University is Dr. Otis Johnson. He has a rich history with Savannah State and in Savannah. He is a former mayor of Savannah. His history with Savannah State is not limited to the fact that he's a former dean of class, the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. This is a timely topic, obviously, based on the turnout today. And this topic was student generated, okay? The students chose the topic for this particular lecture. So thank you again. There is a program evaluation. If you did not receive one, we're going to have copies in the back. Please fill this out before you leave today. Your opinions and your comments do help us plan future events and lecture series here at SSU and certainly through Asa H. Gordon Library. So we appreciate your feedback, especially your comments. And without further ado, Dr. Otis Johnson, our scholar in residence. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I first want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I know that with the urging of some faculty members, you felt that you ought to be here, and that's the way faculty members should do. Uh, but some of you are here because you understand uh, the seriousness of this topic, and I guess you're hoping that when you leave, you know a little more about it than when you came, and that's certainly my goal. I'd like to thank our uh, head librarian, Ms. Faoya, for giving me the opportunity to be the scholar in residence here and to give me a home in the Ace of Gordon Library. The other staff, Ms. Rich, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, Ms. Uh, Denard, and the other people have been extremely helpful to me uh, during my tenure here. I want to start with a disclaimer that I am not an economist. And therefore, I won't have a whole lot of squiggly charts, <laughs> which economists are known to have. Uh, I have been uh, a instructor in sociology and in social work out here for a long time. <coughs> and so I will be coming to you uh, from a social science perspective on this particular issue. As uh, Ms. Rich said, I have been in public service for more than 50 years. Uh, I've been an elected official for 18 years. So I think I know a little bit about this topic because all during my career, I have tried to advance this issue of equality and equity. So let's get started. And I always like to begin uh, with telling you what I'm going to attempt to tell you, or at least we're going to have a dialogue about this. And so I don't know if you have this outline uh, as a handout or not, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to first uh, give some working definitions. I don't, and I never, assume that students know, or even the general audience knows, all of the concepts that we're going to talk about and how they're going to be used in this dialogue that we're going to have. So we're going to go through some very important concepts so that we are talking off the same page. And then we're going to talk about social mobility in American society, what it means, what it doesn't mean. And then I'm going to put that in the context of the American dream. The American dream is an interesting, an interesting to say the least, uh, part of the American ethos. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm mindful that I only have an hour, and you could spend years <coughs> on this topic, and we're going to do it in 60 minutes. Then I'm going to talk about the impact of social inequality and the threat that it has uh, to our society. And we're going to once again go through this issue of untangling what is equality, what is equity, what is important in terms of 
these two terms to us, and then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. We all talk about equality, and I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't want equality. It is something that is almost assumed in the American culture. And although this topic uh, has international connotations, we're going to limit it because of time today to just the United States society. So equality denotes that everyone is at the same level and that everything is shared with exact division. Now these are what we call ideal definitions for these concepts. This is what things are supposed to be, not yet what we're going to talk about, the difference between what we profess as a society and what the reality is as a society. And equity refers to the qualities of justice. And I didn't make that word up. That, that, that's from my source, justice. I, I don't hear that very often, but I want to just make, make a point that, that that is a word, justice, fairness, impartiality, and even-handedness. That's what equity means. And we'll go into a little more detail about that toward the end. And again, equality equals quantity. Quantity. While equity equals quality. So if you had to give a distinction between equality and equity, equity means fairness and the <coughs> kinds of things uh, that we talk about as being fair and just and equality means that we should be starting at the same place with the same kinds of tools, the same opportunities. That's the difference between equality and equity. And I'll give a different slant on that definition a little later because we need to be sophisticated as college students, as citizens, you know, as leaders. When we use these terms, we need to be careful. Uh, one of my pet peeves is the way we talk about desegregation and integration. And that's another lecture that I'd love to give one day because we talk about integration when really what we're talking about is desegregation. And so when we talk about equity, we need to know that it is talking about the quality of life and the opportunity that we have. <coughs> and when we talk about equality, we mean having the same opportunities for goods and services and opportunities. Income inequality. You cannot go a week now where on the news or in the newspaper or on the internet there is something about income inequality. Income inequality, according to some people now, is the civil rights challenge of the 21st century for this society. Income inequality is a measure of the distribution of income that highlights the gaps between individuals or households making most of the income in a given country and those making very little. And I do have a couple of charts that will illustrate this further on. We, we have to understand the importance of this term social stratification because it is so, social stratification that leads to income inequality. And I want to say that again. It is social stratification that leads to income inequality. Social stratification is the division of large numbers of people into layers 
according to their relative property, power, and prestige. And this applies to both nations and to people within a nation, society, or other group. Very important is social stratification that leads to <coughs> income inequality and a whole lot of other things that we'll talk about as we go along. Social stratification puts people in stratas in the society. That's what stratification means. That people are divided according to certain characteristics in the society. And in this society, generally we talk about upper income, middle income, and lower income people in terms of the distribution of power, privilege, and money. The people in the upper class have more power, more prestige, and certainly a whole lot more money. Then you've got the middle class, which is now another topic that you cannot spend a week without hearing about, is the shrinking of the middle class and the losing of ground in terms of money, prestige, and power among this group. And most people will tell you that the most important strata in the U.S. society has been the middle class. It's the question about whether they will maintain that kind of position because they're being squashed. And then you have the lower class, those folk who have less power, less money, and less prestige. Some of us know firsthand what that's about. Because some of us started there, and we worked our way out of that class into the middle class, and that is part of what we're going to talk about when we get to the American dream. Now, the American dream is, well, let, let, let me, let me um, one of my favorite people, Malcolm X, said that for black people, there is no American dream, there's only American nightmare. Because of the prejudice and discrimination and racism that black people have suffered through centuries, he, in a speech, in Detroit <coughs> some years ago said that, hey, you know, I think it was Detroit, he might have been. So anyway, he said, but he said that the American dream is that you have equal opportunity to get a good education, to have an adequate income, either from a job that you work on or from a business that you own because that's the way you get income unless you have a fat daddy who dies and leaves you some money. <laughs> Adequate personal income. Then access to quality affordable health care. You can't work, you can't run a business if you're sick all the time. And if you don't have adequate income, then your access to affordable health care is limited. And that's what the Affordable Health Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, is all about. Trying to improve access so that people can have quality affordable health care. The financial ability to support children through college. That's part of the American dream that you will have enough income and be healthy enough to keep that income coming so that when you have children, your children will have the opportunity to go as far in education as possible. 
and it swings back around to having a good education. All these things are interrelated and interdependent. Then you need to have assets, assets sufficient to purchase a home. Assets is the total sum of what you have after you paid off your debts. That's what asset is. And right now, a whole lot of you are piling up a lot of debt with these student loans. And so it's going to take you a while to get to the point where you can build assets. But that's part of the American dream. And home ownership is one of the principles of the American dream. And then finance, <coughs> finally, to be financially secure when you get old like me. That's the American dream. That's as simple as I could put it. Because that's what people believe you should have the opportunity to achieve. Am I clear? Think about the absence of the opportunity to achieve these things which this society says you should have the opportunity to achieve. And when you can't achieve most of those, and everybody is holding this up as the ideal, how do you feel about yourself and your family? Bad. Now I'm a Baptist, so when I give a rhetorical question like that, I want somebody in the Amen to say, right? <laughs> 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 me. But when you can't believe that you can achieve these things, it's no longer a dream. If you look in the dictionary about dreams, and look in the dictionary about nightmares, you know what I'm talking about. Because it's scary when you believe you should have the opportunity and the right to achieve these things and everything in your life says you can. Now, let's look at intergenerational mobility. Because this is where we get really down to it. Intergenerational mobility is a sociological concept that says you can go up and down the social class ladder. That's what mobility means. You're able to start out, like some of us in here, and through education and hard work and accumulating assets and staying out of trouble, we can move from the lower class into the middle class. That is becoming more difficult for a large segment of the American population. Structural mobility says that changes in society allow large numbers of people to move up or down the class level. I was born in 1942 when segregation was the law of the land in the South. And there were large numbers of African Americans locked in to the caste structure that was segregation. And because of the Civil Rights Movement and the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Civil Rights Act and the 68 Housing Act, we were able to move many of us from lower class to middle class. And there's nothing pejorative about lower class. It's just a capital <coughs> that says you have less what? Money, power, and prestige. So that means that large numbers of people can move from one class into another class, either upward or downward. There's an example in the book that I 
uh, used to prepare for this lecture. It says, if through job training, a large number of people go into the STEM field, they're going to have opportunities to move up. At the same time, the outsourcing of manufacturing jobs is affecting a large number of people that are going to lose those jobs and go down in their class status. The final one is exchange mobility and pretty much this sums up where we are right now. Large numbers of people move up or down the class ladder, but on balance, on balance, the proportions of the social classes remain about the same. Rich folks stay rich. The middle class people used to pass, you know, their class structure from themselves on to their children. And there was an opportunity for lower income people uh, through education and hard work and doing the right, the right things to move up. But the proportions didn't change until recently when the middle class is shrinking and the rich folk are getting rich, and the poor folk are just stuck. So if you had to describe the class system right now, this would be a system where you had only exchange mobility at best, where we've got a system uh, that really isn't working for everybody. Now, I've lifted up these three criteria for determining class status, and that's wealth, power, and prestige. Right now, it's common in sociology books to see these five stratas in the society. We've got the upper class, and now we're calling them the uber rich, right? Y'all, y'all, see that term? The super rich, super rich, and then you've got the upper middle class, and then the lower middle class, and then. What a lot of people like to refer themselves to if they're not in the rich class or the middle class as the working class. Nobody just gleefully de 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 defines themselves as lower class because of the pejorative nature of the term and the stereotype of the term of being lower class. So you got working class. These are the folks who work in the factories, uh, who do the, uh, the kind of clerical work, those folk who are um, uh, working now uh, in the fast food industry, in the hospitality industry. Then you've got uh, what the sociologists are defining now as a lower class. Those people who are chronically unemployed, they, uh, a large number of them suffer from mental illness and substance abuse. In other words, they are really, really having a hard time. So this is right now the current American class system. And I know all of you would love to be where? <laughs> That's the American dream. Have you ever heard of the Horatio Alger? myth is that you can start in the lower class and you can work your way to the upper class. Well, it's still possible, but the chances are not as good as they used to be. That's the, that's the thing. It's not that you can't. It's just that it is far more difficult now to achieve that dream. 
Now, I told you I wasn't going to give you a lot of figures, but in order to put all of this in context, you got to see these numbers. <coughs> this is a study that was done and released on February the 19th, 2014. So it, it's recent. In other words, like some of us say, the, the ink is still dry, basically. The change in the income of Americans from 1971 to 2011. And I hope that you have been listening to the rhetoric about the 1% versus the 99%. All right, here is some figures. Now, if you don't believe it, you go get your argument together. This is, this is the argument, and I'll, when I do something like this, I'll always back it up. Because somebody, is not want, they don't want to believe. So if you don't, then that's okay. Just go get your facts. This study says that in the United States, in terms of the change in income between 1971 and 2011, by the top 1%, their income increased 128%. Wow, the 99%, their income increased in that same time period, 2.3%. So you can see how the wealth is being concentrated and while we struggle. In the South, because I wanted to give you geographic comparison. This is the United States in the South, which has always been an economically less prosperous region of the country. The income for the 1% in the South increased 107.2% in that time period. While for the 99%, all of you in here, and your parents, your uncles, and everybody else, increased 5.7%. Now, how many of you are from the state of Georgia? Let me see here. The majority of you. In our state, <coughs> and you can see that this state is not doing as well as the region, and the region is not doing as well as the nation. But in our state, the income during that time period increased for the 1%, 96.1%. And for us, how much did it increase? 3.4. I'm pausing because I wanted to send in. We're talking about income inequality. And we look at what the 1% is getting compared to the 99%. And we're going to talk about equal opportunity and fairness. I don't think so. Average income. Same period. The average income for the 1% was $1,040,506. That was their average income in 2011, which was the last cutoff date that they collected the data on. And how much were the rest of us making? $42,000. $696. Their income was 24.5 times greater than you and your parents 
and everybody else in that 99%. In the South, 921,361, that's 1%. And all of you hardworking people, $41,075 for a difference that the 1% had a 22.4 times greater income increase than everybody else in the country. And in our state, and you see how these, these disparities keep showing up, the United States has one number, the region has one number, our state has a number. And they all go down. So you ought to be concerned about it. I mean, the first thing is to try to get to the regional level, right? That would be progress. It wouldn't be that much, but it would still be progress. 770823 dollars for Georgia. You could live pretty well on $770,000. That's one year. While you had to struggle to live on $39,094. There's a whole lot of things I could do with the difference, which is 19.7 times difference. That's the reality that we face with these two charts. If you didn't believe it, now you have what we call some hard data to document the claim. Now let's talk about this issue. Is there fear in the disparity? Is there social justice in the spirit. Now, I think everybody knows the answer to that. And we won't get into the arguments yet about what causes it. But everybody has to realize now that there is a difference. And the question is, is this gap fair? Now see, I don't argue that there shouldn't be a gap between upper, middle, and lower. I don't argue that at all. That's just the way it is. But my problem is that there used to be the opportunity to move up and to improve. That's being blocked by a number of forces. <coughs> and they must be dealt with unless we need to start talking about equality and we need to stop talking about having opportunity for everyone to achieve. Everyone does not start at the same place. And everyone does not have the same needs. Let me give you an example. Rich people and upper middle class people who can ensure that their children get quality preschool begin their education far more advanced than lower income kids who don't have the wherewithal to get a good preschool education. So they're not starting at the same place. So it becomes almost impossible for them to compete. And the whole concept of equality says we start at the same scratch line. Well, the circumstances are not allowing everybody to start at the same scratch line. So equity means then, it is the means, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. Equity talks about the means to achieve an outcome of equality. While equality is talking about everybody starting at the same place. The myth of America is that everybody starts at the same place. That's a myth. That's not true. And the reason I took pains to go through the class system is to emphasize 
the fact that everybody is starting. We don't have a classless society. If we had a classless society, theoretically, only theoretically, because humans always find ways to differentiate among themselves. So just theoretically, if we had a classless society, everybody would be starting out equal. That a concept of equal opportunity is where I am. And I have never been, and I will never be, just a researcher or scholar that doesn't carry uh, with it an announced and qualified opinion. And so the challenge of the 21st century is the challenge of income inequality. And the means to deal with that is equal opportunity. If you don't have an equal opportunity for an education, a job, all those other things I put up there, it is impossible for you to achieve what you need to have a decent level of life. Now, so that I have time for you to get involved in this conversation, you can't, or you should, as a scholar, do simply the analysis. And that's, that's what I was talking about a little earlier. You do the analysis, and then you ought to propose a solution to the problem. When you create how, how, who, who can tell me the steps in the scientific method? Well, what, 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 is, what is the first thing you do in the scientific method? Uh, you identify a problem. And that, if that's what you were going to say, young lady, that's right. You identify a problem. Then the second thing that you do is what? You do a review of the literature to try to learn as much about the problem as you can. And as a result of that, what's the third thing you do? Hey, boy, that hypothesis has been trying to get <laughs> Yeah. After you have identified the problem and you've studied the problem, you all come up with an uh, educated guess about the solution of the problem, right? And then the fourth thing is, what do you do? You test your hypothesis. You develop a research design, you tell them how you're going to test it, and you're going to tell them how you're going to evaluate the data when you test it, when the test is over, and how you're going to report the data. And then what's the final thing? You, you come to conclusions, and then you present those conclusions either as affirming or negating what? Uh, y'all wanted to get the hypothesis, but now y'all won't get the hypothesis. That's what this is all about. So now, let's look at this. In this country, you have two ideological camps that fight each other over what to do. Very few people who are in their right mind will tell you we don't have a problem. The difficulty is in what to do about the problem. Now, on, and, and I have uh, some, anybody in here, how many in here have taken um, um, philosophy? One. All right, there's a man by the name of Hegel who has a, a dialectic concept where he has what he calls the synthesis on one side of the issue and the antithesis is the opposite side of the issue. And then when those two come together, they form what is known uh, uh, as a synthesis. Now, Congress used to work like that one time where the Democrats 
would take one position and the Republicans would take another position and then they'd both get competing bills and they would all, you know, uh, vie for or dominance over the idea. And then uh, after they decided on how they were going to compromise, which is now a nasty word, then they would come to some conclusion that would work for the good of the whole. So you could look at this liberal strategy of approaching this issue as saying that the government should intervene because inequality in America is due to structural issues, to policies and laws that have been passed to advantage one group over another group. That's why they have so many lobbyists in Washington, so that the rich folk can try to persuade the lawmakers to make the laws to their advantage. So there are structural causes according to the liberal analysis of these issues and only those structural changes um, will lead to some kind of amelioration of the conditions. And it also says that there are lack of opportunity and those lack of opportunities many times are based on discriminatory practice. And we all know that women earn 77 cents to every dollar that a man makes. We know that black people are still the last hired in the first five. We know all that litany that has to do with discrimination. That's real. You know, that, that's, that's not fancy. That's real. Then on the opposite side is where you get the personal responsibility argument. These people would not be hope if they would just get up off their lazy behind and go to work. Now I know y'all have heard that because they talk about you. <laughs> Most poor people in America work every day. What is the minimum wage? I see y'all ought to know that because some of y'all work for the minimum wage. How much is it? How much is it? $7.25. All right. Do you know what $7.35 an hour comes up for a 40 hour week and a 52 uh, week year? Somewhere around $14,000. Now, an individual really can't live on $14,000 and pay rent insurance for a car and for uh, health insurance to buy food and you all know you got the dress. <laughs> you can't do much with $14,000 but that's the minimum wage. The poverty level for uh, a family of four is <coughs> roughly between twenty-three and $24,000. Think about that. Supporting four people on $24,000. So even if you had, and everybody now is talking about the need to be married, well, let's take that case. And I'm, I'm for marriage. I think people ought to be married if they want to be married. But if you put two minimum wage workers together, 14 times 2 is what? Huh? Oh boy. You see what I'm talking about? So, the conservative argument says that the government shouldn't be involved in this. But the reality is the government helped create it by giving tax laws and other kinds of incentives for people to do things that disadvantage working for. But they don't believe it. They should. They believe that that some of them believe that there should be no government. I mean, uh, what's that guy, Ron, uh, Ron, uh, Ron Paul, said? You know, hey, that's government is better. Just just get rid of it. Then the real kicker is the lack of personal responsibility. Rap. 
If you poll people with just work, you wouldn't be poll. You're lazy. All you want to do is wait on that welfare check. And you want food stamps. And you want free health insurance. You're just too lazy. That's why you're poor. You're lazy. And you know what the face of lazy looks like? Look around you. That's what the face of lazy looks like. But the majority of poor people in America don't look like us. Just numerically, there are more poor white people than black and brown people in the United States. But the face that they conjure up in these statements look like black and brown people. And then finally, uh, they say, well, if y'all would just get married and stay married, uh, think of, matter of fact, Paul Ryan just said that uh, either this week or last week, and he's got these female surrogates in the Republican Party now uh, saying that. Well, it's true for that. Because when you have two incomes, you're sure going to do better if you got one income. And if you have one income with children, it's, it's, it's hard. So there's some truth in that. But if you get married and you don't have a good education, you don't have job training, you don't have equal opportunity to a good paying job, if you still are basically uh, relegated to certain sections of the community to live in and housing segregation is real. And all of these things, being married ain't, they ain't gonna make no difference with that. And I know ain't ain't right, but I like ain't, so every now and then I'll put ain't in there. But this is what you, you're up against. So what is the sentence? But let's, 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 let's be real. Let's say there's truth on both polar opposites. So now let's talk about what we need to do to improve the situation, not just point fingers. But we know we need public and private sectors to step up and remove the barriers that we know are there. We need to have more opportunities for people to obtain economic self-sufficiency, which means good education, good job training, good job opportunities, good pay. Then we have to have folk not drop out of school, right? Not go on drugs, not commit crimes, and do all those things that send you on that path that those other folks want to tell you that you, that they're, they're, that they're, that they're kind of slowing down on this now, but there were companies that were making predictions on the number of prison beds that were needed when children failed the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. It's called the Cradle to Prison Pipeline. And there are folk out there who are calculating how they can make this profitable. There's a big industry in fighting poverty. So these are the things that we have to do. Recognize that there's truth in both polar camps. And then we've got to address the truths and we've got to eliminate and fight the myths. So that's my presentation.